you Jump, 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 jump What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party This is what we done started Peace and love, party people. It's Talib Kweli, the MCEO, the BKMC. This is another fantastic episode of the world's best podcast, The People's Party. And as usual, I have my lovely and talented co-host and my good friend Jasmine Lee in the place to be. What's up, Jasmine? How you doing? <laughs> oh, the claps are back. The claps are back. Welcome back to LA, Talib. We missed you. Hey, I'm back. You yeah. know, I'm back in the house. I'm very excited about today's episode. Yes, we are. I'm excited about all the episodes, but... um. Today's episode is someone who has personally impacted my life as a friend and a, as an artist and as an inspiration. We have a lot of legends on this show, but mm-hmm. this guest is in a class by himself. He's a legend amongst legends. He is a rapper, a singer, a songwriter, DJ, producer, super producer, absolutely certified in the game. He brings the P-Funk to the G-Funk. He has worked with the best of the best in this business, from Snoop Dogg to Dr. Dre to Corrupt to Tupac to Tony, Tony, Tony to Eric Sermon to myself, just to name a few. He is a real, actual DJ. He made his name as a DJ, cutting his teeth on vinyl since middle school. That's been a long time. Over the years, he has been known as an architect of the West Coast sound. Um, He was an early pioneer of mixtape culture, back when mixtape culture was actually about tapes. Now people call everything a tape, but this man actually put out a tape. (laughs) His mixtape from 1987, The Red Tape, is legendary, is genre-defining. As an artist, he has an incredible run of records that include Quick as the Name, Way Too Funky, Safe and Sound, Rhythmalism, Balance and Options, Under the Influence, Trauma, The Book of David, The Midnight Life. He is such a star that he plays himself on television and things like Entourage. You might have seen him in Everybody Hates Chris. He has a great relationship with uh, Chris Rock. Matter of fact, Chris Rock plays way too funky on his top 25 hip-hop albums all time. One of my favorite hip-hop albums all time is Balance of Options. And it's amazing to me how this man... People have different entry points for this man. Mm -hmm. He's so good at what he does, everyone can have a different favorite. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for America's most complete artist, David Blake from the CPT. Quick, 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 Galodian himself. DJ Quick in the place to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the first man to go that way. I know. <laughs> left handed. Everybody goes this way. Oh, you're left handed. Got it. <laughs> Look at it, he's thinking like camera a camera supposed to see your back. Oh, okay. No buts about it. That's the first That's thing the you learn. See that? Vasquez. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Quick? Chilling. Thank Chilling. you for coming to do this Chilling. show. Thanks for having me. It's my honor and my pleasure. Um, you and I were talking in the hallway with Jared, and a lot of people don't know this, but I want to start with this story. A lot of people don't know that there would be no Talib Kweli as far as career-wise if it wasn't for you. You and Snoop Dogg were on the radio when I dropped my first uh, single, uh, not my first single, but my second single. The first one we were really trying to get to the radio, right? And you in particular, um, the West Coast just loved this record. Shout out to DJ High Tech. Yeah. His production, uh, Chops, uh, really found an ear in the West Coast. But you in particular were on the radio in Los Angeles yes, and you were playing the blast over and over again. And New York, pay attention, shame on you, New York, because <laughs> the record, shout out to DJ Enough. Because DJ Enough was supportive of the record in New York, but New, uh, New York in general didn't support the record. It was L.A. and it was you in particular. So I want to start by Man. thanking you for helping me to start my career. Man, you're welcome. No doubt, no doubt. You owe me a beer. I owe you a beer. Okay, I got you, I got Get you. Beer. Goodbye, your brewski. Got it. Um, but not just with the blast... Um, I don't know if you've heard this before, but often I get asked about who was the producer who has influenced you the most. And I'm obviously going to say High Tech right. and Mad Lib and, and Kanye and certain other people I, I, I work with, but your name comes up for me. You taught me the most about vocal recording. You were the first person to produce vocals for me. Do you remember this? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was for Put It In The Air, which, Put it in the air yeah. which is a record that Sounds almost out of place on my debut album. <laughs> you know what I'm we be blazing. It's yeah. so West Coast. Yeah, it is. But on I purpose. needed. What you were we about to say? On purpose. On purpose, right? But I needed that quick uh, sound on my record. It's like high tech used to be like. Um, I used to kick a verse and go hard. I come out the booth and I don't know, dog. I don't, <laughs> I don't know, because you know he's like a perfectionist. 
you, your style was different. You'd be like, yo, that shit was fire. That shit was crazy. Oh my God, you're amazing MC. But you know what? Go back in one more time. Uh-huh. Is that bad? No. That's how you did it. But you'd be like, go back in one more time. We were able to cut vocals and like the songs we did, we did like three records in a matter of minutes because you gave me the, inspired me on vocal production. Thank you, bro. Um, so talk to me about knowing how to get the best out of a performer in the booth. I always want to do for the artist what I would do to myself mm-hmm. when I'm producing myself. Challenge myself. Mm-hmm. You know, I got that from Teddy Riley. Mm-hmm. Always challenge yourself. Like, when you're comfortable with it, get uncomfortable and do something bigger and better. You know, strive for something that doesn't exist yet, mm-hmm. you know, musically. And I, I add that to just my work ethic when, I, when I'm dealing with people. Like, I try not to push too hard because, you know, you get somebody flustered and before you know it, it blows up in your face. But I always want them to know that you could do something way hot. Like we're looking for the magic, not just the words and your cadence, but there's a magic that happens that just sounds forever. I'm trying to find forever. Mm-hmm. Finding forever, basically. Trying to with find somebody. forever. You know what I mean? Yeah. A record that you can hear 30 years from now and it still resonates. Yeah, and the record we did almost 30 years now, it still resonates. I remember mm-hmm. us thinking as East Coast our ears are not attuned to certain West Coast sounds and us assuming that all West Coast producers are just using keyboards or, you know, just trying to sound like uh, P-Funk or Roger Troutman and this and that. And you brought a bag of African instruments to the studio. And I remember thinking like, wow, I thought these were all sounds he got out of the keyboard. Just all sampled? Yeah. No, we make the sounds. You make the sounds. That gives you an edge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, because everybody has this this plate of sounds that they work from, like, you know, a, a group of sounds that are kind of common mm-hmm. when you buy drum machines and keyboards, I always figure to make my own sound. So I just, you stand out a little bit. Yeah. Word up. Mm-hmm. Now on the, um, I think it's under the influence album I'm on, uh, the prom, the mm-hmm. intro track. It's a great track. Um, never in my wildest dreams would I think I would be on a track with DJ Quick, AMG as Shaheem. Yeah, right. That's a very interesting a combination of pairing, people. Right? <laughs> Did you ever figure out who Shaheem was so mad at on no. that verse? Because he's really angry at somebody. I don't know. We we always talked about his affiliation with Wu, uh-huh. and um, I didn't prod, but I know he had he had got into a little bit of trouble at that time. So I think yeah. he was venting about that situation. You know, he had to do a little bit of time. Or yeah, he got a good verse out of it. Right on. It's a real good verse. Yeah, Shaheem the kids. My yeah, guy. man. Um, and shout out to uh, my man Jesus on the bass, Eric Coombs. Yeah, he was in those sessions as well. Yeah, he um, he went on to form that group Lettuce. Yes, and uh, the Lettuce guys I work very closely with, um, Adam Deitch and Eric Krasno. These guys, guys, yeah, produce all my records. Oh my I do gosh. shows with them. They plug me in with that like crunchy Denver EDM scene. <laughs> As they well, some, some Lettuce records. is crunchy. <laughs> it's crunchy out there in Denver, Colorado. Man. Um. One of my greatest hip hop moments, and it's like a mythological story I tell, is being on tour with De La Soul around the year 2000. There's a back to back to school concert that you were supposed to either be close to last or headlining on, and Big Boy, who was also a guest on the show, got on stage and announced that you had gotten into a motorcycle accident, and he's like, "Quick, will not be here, and let's all pray for him and help that he is pulling through." And it was very sad. Mm-hmm. And then you pulled up. Fucked up. Bleeding. Bleeding. Neck brace on. <laughs> and did a classic this, set. This show <laughs> must <laughs> go on. Go on. <laughs> tell, us, tell us that story. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, I was uh, grieving, man. My boy Mossberger just got killed. And Rest in like, peace, Mossberger. We were working in the studio on yeah. his album, and we decided to go ahead and take the day off so everybody could go do Fourth of July, and then we'll resume on the 5th. Bad idea. I always work holidays. I always work my birthday because, you know, that's where you get the most done. You okay. know what I mean? To me, it's like, yeah, fuck my birthday. Whatever. Let me okay. finish this record. And I let him go home, and, and and he didn't come back the next day. Mm-hmm. So I'm in the studio the next day finishing his record, like the one we just worked on yesterday or the day before. And it's like, this really is horrible. Mm-hmm. So I was, um, I would just start stunting hard on my bike, you know, after that shit. I just I jumped on my Honda. Started getting down. I had my boys come over. It was like, hey, follow me. I'm going to show y'all something. It's a new trick I learned. They was like, cool. So they followed me up the hill. I come down the hill. And I tried to do the standing dead Christ, but I was going too fast. 
jumped up on the bike, and the wind snatched me off of it. I hit the ground. Boom. I hit the ground so hard that I was knocked out. And when I woke up, I was still sliding. Wow. <laughs> it was like wow. I was terminal velocity. <laughs> wow. I watched my motorcycle just go can open this little car. <laughs> And I'm like hitting those bubbles in the road and shit. Shit ripped my hip open and shit. I was like, God damn. My man came up to him. Yo, man, we don't want to see you kill yourself, man. Oh, man, the stunt went wrong. It was windy up here. Mm. It's usually not windy, but it was at that time when I did the stunt, the wind just kicked up. Wow. So I drove myself to the hospital on the bike. Me and the bike both leaking. <laughs> 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 shit. <laughs> <laughs> Get up there. I got patched up. And I went home, and my leg was just sore. Like, I couldn't move my right leg at all. And I knew I had to do the concert. And I was just like, wow, I'm not going to be able to do it. Mm. Um, so as the hours went by, I didn't want to just be in despair. I'm sore. I'm on medication and whatever. It just got, like, to the, we call it the golden hour. When you know you got to go on stage, you just automatically feel something. Mm -hmm. The golden hour hit, I was like... Wow. <laughs> Got up. <laughs> it was like, wow. pop some more ibuprofen. Hey, I'm going to pull up. And I pulled up. And it's something about that adrenaline. When you hit the stage, mm -hmm. all the pain disappears. For that Ain't moment. that the truth? It's weird. It's like, like, you could be touring. I've, I've, I t t used to tour like 200 days a year. And, you know, you sick and fucked up all day. And, like, all day you're like, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. But the moment you hit stage, all of it goes away. And then it comes right back. back as soon as you leave the as stage. As soon as you leave the stage. That's what? Yeah. Hey, so you've been in that. Oh, uh, yeah. That's the zone. Yeah. That's the adrenaline zone. Because as soon as I was like, thank you for coming out. God bless you. Good night. Right. I walked right backstage and collapsed. Blue. <laughs> Man. But you made it. Oh, adrenaline God. is real. You were the like, youngest of 10, mm -hmm. um, and you were raised in Compton on Spruce Street. Can you tell us what your upbringing was like, and how was a younger quick? My upbringing was, it was I guess it was normal for, for you know, the standards of then. I mean, we didn't know we were poor because we was That's cool with what way. we had. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, you know, picnics and barbecues and going to the beach every now and then with the beach being so close. Like, I didn't, I, I never took that for granted. Like, mm. the beach is like 20 minutes away, right? So it was like, it was, it was, it was paradise until the gang shit started. Mm -hmm. Then it became Beirut. Mm. It became Vietnam. It was like, for a kid who wants to be a DJ, DJ means being social, sharing your music with people and being around people and trying to make friends when dudes just want to beat you up because you got on a color. It was like, you know, it was, it was, it was oxymoronic. It just didn't yeah. make sense to me. And I'm left-handed. I'm creative. So, I, you know, it was like, how do I navigate this, you know, this gang shit and be who I am? Ultimately, it, it never worked because the streets just kept, continued to get worse and worse and worse. And I continued to get better and better and better. So I had ended up having to move and go somewhere where I could blow up and not be a target because you're only going to end up two places in Compton. You know, it's just slim pickings for a young black man there. And I had to get out. Man. Bounced, went to, went to L.A., met some real cool dudes. L.A. is Hollywood adjacent. I mm -hmm. ended up in Hollywood from there, but I would have never made it from Compton. We're about to interview a comedian named uh, Ron Funches, and he has a bit about how the media will teach you that there's only two types of black men, a thug and dead. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's funny because it's true. But um, that just, I thought about that joke when you just said what you said. Um, your mother back then exposed you to Al Green, Curtis Mayfield, Everything. Tower of Power, P Funk, George Clinton. Yeah. Um, Temptations. But, yeah, man. Shout out to your mom Earth for Wind doing that. Um, um, Aretha Franklin. Just word. But P Funk in particular is the foundation in a lot of ways of what West Coast hip hop became. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think that occurred? Um, honestly, if you listen to P-Funk music, it's serious, but it's also so insanely playful that it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Like these dudes be playing limericks and shit, like, you know, fucking, you know, melodies from cartoons and shit. Dun, 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 dun. Like right. they, you know what I mean? Like Bugs Bunny. Mm -hmm. Like to be able to be that far out there mm -hmm. to a talent and still to add elements of to your music that everybody can relate to, especially young us. Yeah. 
you know, it was it was youthful, but it was also advanced. It's like sampling. They, they were they were sampling. Yeah, you know what I mean. But it was it's just something about the way they it was it sounded the EQ of it, and George Clinton being like the 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 orator, like mm-hmm. the he's the there's not a problem that I can't fix because I can right. do it in the mix. He's that guy right. on those records. You know what I mean? So it's like you're getting you're buying these songs. These albums are like listening to a radio station that you really really like. W E F U N K We Funk. You know, right. and then his spinoffs were all funky, like Boosie Collins and, you know, the Brides of Funkenstein and Fred Wesley and the Horny Horns. These are all incredible fucking people. You know, mm-hmm. how could you not like that music? And it was timely. We liked our other stuff like Brick, Das, when that come out, you know, them big fat records. But Flashlight mm-hmm. just takes over the damn house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She kills the Aqua Boogie. That's a long one, too. The extended version, you could... Back there, you could party longer. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Yeah. But the attention play. spans was longer too. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Nobody has attention spans yeah. anymore. Back then, you would actually listen to an album. If it took 30 minutes, 40 minutes, you actually listened to the whole thing. Yeah. And you expanded on or expounded on uh, just knowing the foundation. It's not just about the lead singer, but about who's playing this. Yeah. And back then, you had the lyrics and the, the lyric sheet and the credits. So mm-hmm. it was an experience doing listening to albums back then because you get familiar with the artist and you feel like you almost know him. There's a kinship that mm-hmm. happens when you're reading the, you know, excuse my proper. People tell me I sound I talk like a white boy. I just <laughs> when I'm talking about music, I think I got to be a little bit more succinct and you know, you know what I'm saying. You know, she, she, you know, she, right. people, but you know, Quinn, there's more than two types of black dudes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Please tell your man Francis that. Yeah, no <laughs> you know, the nerdy ones too. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> I'm, yes, I'm we have them here. You At know, people's party. I'm a geek. I'll be the first to tell you. I love equipment. But yeah, it was a it was an experience, man. And and it made you buy into their brand. Not, you know, not just this this album. We waited six to nine months for the next album and couldn't wait. Like right. waited for it, like a new Jordan. Right. Can you take us through the time in your life where your mom fell upon hard times? You guys had to move down south and you were homeless. And no, what did you learn? This is this is what it is. I think that was a little taken out of context for um, for unsung. Okay. Oh. Um, but the the facts are, is that my mom took out this dope loan to bring our house up. So she took out a loan and she started, you know, bought me a car. She was doing all kind of cool shit. But I have a sister who sold crack, who wouldn't stop, and she broke my mama's heart because she got her house raided three times. And my mom just didn't want to live there no more after the po- when the police raid your house, you just feel raped. Mm. And my mom was like, and I just beautified this house. God, there's a new gate. The house, whole house got painted. Mm. Balling, like beautiful. Grass and shit. And um, I won't say her name because she she definitely wants to sue me. She actually wants me dead. My sister, she's talking about how she's going to put shit in my mouth when I'm in the casket. It's like, that's so sexy. I don't even know how you think of stuff like that, but mm. just Get help and get on meds and be your fucking sociopath. She got her house raided and mom was enough. Mom packed up her shit and moved right back down to Louisiana so she could have peace of mind. She was mm. done with it. She washed her hands of it. It was like, you know, she's not listening. Police are here every day. This gang shit's gonna kill my two boys. She said, figure it out. Pew. And we had to figure it out. Mm. You know, but back then it was easier to be homeless because everybody had houses and you had cool friends and family yeah. and it wasn't expensive to live. So it wasn't like being homeless at all. It was just like being, you know, staying with the homies or something. Yeah. Jasmine used to be pretty girl homeless. Pretty girl homeless. <laughs> pretty girl That's homeless. what you were. That's you were a pretty thing. boy homeless. <laughs> no, we had uh, uh, Karen Bass here. She's running for mayor. You know, I know Karen Bass. Yeah. Her, her issue is her main focus is homelessness. She says that's the most important issue in L.A. But Jazz yeah, asked her a question was... Well, he was uh, saying she was pretty girl homeless, which I thought sounded funny. We actually cut that part out of the interview. We're not going to cut this part out of the interview. <laughs> but we cut but that part out of the interview. It's a thing. It's a thing. It's a, thing. It's a it's real a thing. It's a privilege that you have because, I mean, I didn't have any money. And yes, I could have called my mother, but she would have been like, bring your ass back from LA. So you got to figure it out. And some people don't have homies' couches that they can surf on because they're not pretty. They're not pretty. <laughs> Say less. Pretty girl homeless. You so, said it, not me. So 
Was I handsome nigga homeless? <laughs> you were pretty boy homeless. I just gave pretty boy homeless. All right, cool. That's pretty boy homeless. Hey, but I paid my way too. Like, you know, I worked. Like, you know what I mean? I ain't gonna just be You should be with... working if you're on somebody's couch. You just, Never be right, a time you know? that you should just be chilling yeah. watching TV. Man, you gotta pay your way. Yeah. Pay like your way. Um, you have always made sure that the world knew about your homies and your family and you mm. rap about them and you talk about them on on your albums, you put everybody on albums. Later on in your career, as we as artists, as gracious people, later you have some uh regrets and <laughs> reservations about some of this stuff. You know what I'm saying? But through you heard the, that? Oh yeah, I first <laughs> I should have stopped putting I'm a fan. Records. I'm a fan. I know your records. You should have stopped dropping albums. Uh, but but you spoke about the situation with your sister, which is tough just now. Yeah. And you got a on, rendezvous? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's I wasn't going to say that record, but yeah. I was going to start with even with Safe and Sound before Ghetto Rendezvous. Yeah. Safe and Sound, you, first of all, shout out to AMG and Second to None and all My these brother. people that you've always uh, shouted still out. still with them. I was it's just in deep. Cleveland with G. Um, but at Safe and Sound, you really detail that story that you just told us. With the crack? Yeah. Ruined, ruined a lot of people's lives. I watched her ruin a lot of people's lives, but I felt... I had to write about it because mm -hmm. her thing was she wanted to be a star. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And she wasn't going to let me live, bro. She she brought me the most tragedy I ever had in my life. Mm. Like purposely not wanting me to be a success, mm. which is creepy. And we're related, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, it's got to be tough. It's, it sounds tough. It's horrible. But, you know, and the funny thing is I still love her. Yeah. But she wants me out of here. Wow. Imagine that. I, For what? I can't imagine. Can't it. I, I, don't have a, I don't have but a, a then, family. No, this relationship is this like is what that. I found out. Mm -hmm. This is the makes it odd. She does keep in touch with some of the other family members, and what they're telling me on the backhand side is she really just wants to be back with you and tour again with you and right. go out and meet all these people. It's like you're embarrassing to me. Like you embarrass us. That's not that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Like we haven't hung out in twenty years. I'm I'm just not having it. Mm -hmm. I found peace, and I'm not letting it go. Peace is important. Yeah. Protect. You got to have boundaries. You do have to have boundaries. I'm also, like I said, from a big family. So, you know, you, you deal with things differently than if it's just two of you guys or whatever. But it's like what I find is like sometimes they just don't know what to say to make it better. So they just keep trying to make it worse because it makes it easier for like, oh, if I know you hate me, then I don't have to work at being a good sister. So maybe she does want to, you know do the right thing and it's just going to take that one that olive one pill? branch to just, it's you gonna know. It's going to take that one drug. <laughs> Don't take the drug. No, I'm talking to her. Oh, oh. It's going to take that one drug to snap her back into normal. It's not going to happen. Well, we all dream, though. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, none of us are doctors or mental health professionals. So right. We can only well, just see, I'm just kidding. I'm not. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I mean, you know, I think communication is is key and even, I'm I'm blessed that you even are Thank you for sharing some of that because I know mm -hmm. some of that is tough. Yeah. Um, you talked about how hard it was to navigate growing up in these uh, war-like environments. Um, and some of that overcame you. You ended up living some of that gangster lifestyle. And it's documented on you know, your records. That your, your gang affiliations have been it's documented. It's funny, too, because I never wanted to be a part of a gang. I did, being a DJ gave mm -hmm. you an out. You didn't have to claim. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, but I grew up in a blood neighborhood, and mm -hmm. all my friends were bloods. But, you know, and I say this, and I don't care. I don't give a fuck who doesn't like it. I would, I was never a gang member. If anything, I would have been the gang leader. Mm. I understand. I understand. Um, so now to the DJing thing, you use the DJing to sort of try to meld these two worlds together. Your mixtape was called The Red Tape. It's yep. a Compton classic. Um, underground terror is crazy. Thank this you. is something you can't even find this on streaming platforms. No. It's just the underground. Um, I was I was uh, really you. into X Clan back mm -hmm. then, and it's like we were too. Yes, <laughs> there's like the X Clan overlap. Um, I don't know the name of the song. I think it's called "Love You Down," or that's what they sang in the hook. Uh, Leroy and the Chocolate Love oh, Life. Oh yeah, Brown Eyes, Sweet Chocolate Mama. So that's the name of the song. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's we better just, than "Love You Down." <laughs> yeah, we're trying to be. We're uh, you know, we Glee Club kids too. So ah, I was like, we kids. were just trying to play, you know, play up the, the singing thing. That was D, second and none, and KK. Well, that makes sense because I was going to ask you, were y'all just playing around or just no, this record really is sing. so well realized they can real, They can really sing. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? They did, I did the song If You Want It on them and that was all over the radio. Just catchy. It was like the first singing hip hop. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. From a street level. Yeah. yeah. 
Now it's the thing. Now it's the thing. You gotta sing every hook. Yeah. Um, born and raised in Compton, just as an East Coaster. Hard. Yeah, it's hard. It felt like that record, that beat could anybody from any place in the Would country serve that beat. Yeah. Um, SP twelve hundred. Of course. Uh, take us through creating that record. Um, just that's beat mining, going through the records that you get, finding records. Because once you run out of things to sample, you gotta feed that beast of creativity. Mm -hmm. So I have friends who uh. Uh, you know, was collecting records. And I remember that album, you know, um, Hot Butter Soul from my mom growing up. She used to bang that album, right? It's a good one. So we got it again. Long ass to songs. It. Yeah, right? Yeah. Seven minutes a piece. Yeah. Four songs. Right. Dope ass album. Still went platinum. Um, it was something about um, hyperbolic sis syllabic sesquidaily mystic when it came on. I've just, never heard somebody actually say the name of that song before. Hyperbolic syllabic sesquidaily mystic. <laughs> say that five times fast. Yeah, yeah. I, I won't. <laughs> but it was, yeah, it was just the funk of it. That 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 piano, that one bar funk, that one mm. bar, do 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 do, and start over. One bar is that has that much music in it. I'm getting chills thinking about it. Yeah. So I just put it in, and anything you put in the SB 1200 just sounds grittier, grimier, funkier, bigger. Help, like it got nougat on it, just melts. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? It's just crazy. <laughs> Dude. And I add some drums to it, and it was ready. Mm. And I um I offered it to Player Ham, who I was in the group, Penthouse Players Click at the time. Mm. When I got the SB 1200, his mom bought it for us. He actually, you know, helped us finance it or whatnot. And, um, you know, his he's like, He's a conscious rapper, super yeah. conscious. And they were, uh, that group and him in particular were very inspirational and influential on you, right? Yeah. 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 They were, they were like my big brothers yeah. that I never had. Um, I think he passed on the beat or whatever. And I was like, cool. Any beat he did, he passed on, I just rapped to it. You know, like passed me the eight ball. I gave him that. He was like, it's too silly. And mm. I'm like, cool. I understand. So I would sample stuff for him like, um, like Joe Tex records or, uh, Angel Dust. Joe by, Tex don't want the woman with no skinny legs. Yeah. Skinny <laughs> legs, no. But that uh, Angel Dust by Gil Scott Heron, he liked those kind of beats. Mm. Um, we even found this song, Life of Fortune and Fame, in a in a 99 cent bin, um, Sliding the Family Stone, like one of his obscure records. And it was that. When it break, it was just crazy. Uh, yeah. Cam used that, wrapped over it, uh, West Coast Cam. Yeah. It was just, I looped that for him. He liked obscure stuff, you know. Um, but he didn't, I don't think he wanted that one. So I just made that my calling card, my born and raised in Compton, even though I wasn't living in Compton at the time. I'd been three years removed. Mm. I was in just LA, South Hollywood. Central, Harlem 30s mm. with the Crips. <laughs> right. <laughs> Loving it too. They was cool as hell. <laughs> That's the duality. Yeah. Like, how can I be a gangbanger when. People from either side treat you well or treat you fucked up. It's not. It's how do you? Right. Those of us from not not from LA though that can't relate. We don't know that until we live here. Then you see it because uh, it's sold to us. Like if you see somebody from the other side, it's on immediately. I wish we had figured that out a long time ago. Because now everybody here gets it, and the OGs have been, you know, have been interceding mm -hmm. with the youngsters. To tell them like these old beefs that niggas had back in the day is they not your beef. Be mm -hmm. This this neighborhood ain't your enemy, right? Just because you were g grandfathered into that that notion, this is not your people's. This ain't the people you're supposed to be going over and kill. So yeah, that's positive. You yes. know, that's that's what's happening. But you know, I just hope it ain't too little, too late. Like I hope we still, you know. <laughs> we're losing black people in numbers, right. bro. We're twenty three percent right. of America consists is like what is this? That's right. You know, it's, it's, it's and we can't distant. afford to be taking each other out at this point. Exactly. Yeah. You know, definitely cannot. Just trying to quiet down the noise in the background so people could get on with living. Right up. Um, what was the impact Easy E had on your <laughs> life? I was just looking at Easy on my phone on the way up here. Wow. Who didn't want to be this Napoleon mother prince? He was a hip -hop <laughs> prince. This motherfucker was so cool. Y'all don't understand, man. I got the biggest flex in the world. Easy E used to come to my house, knock on the door, come inside, and kick it. Yes. Like, bro, you a millionaire, nigga. We living in Gardena. Like, what are you doing over <laughs> here, my nigga? Like, you know, he, he was just a cool, smart, super, so smart that it was like every single thing he said made sense. Mm. You know, and you could use it. Like, when he gave you music advice, you use it and you get the result that he said you would get. Such a, you know, he was here for too short of a time because there was still so much that he could have done. 
You know, after, mm-hmm. you know, the little feud with NWA, when that would have been over, they would have just started back doing music again. They was already mm-hmm. ready to do it. Yeah. And he got sick. Yeah. You know, but super genius, super fun, silly, cool, brother, gangster, everything. Just the whole, he was this whole package. But he was just, he was too handsome for his own good. This dude used to get attacked by women. Mm. A lot of people don't know that. It's like, he was a womanizer. No, they wanted to, like the song, we want to fuck you, easy. Right. That's, that was his life. Girls were just gravitated to him. You know, he wasn't a bad looking guy. You know right. what I mean? And he just, he tripped and fell into a lot, between a lot of legs back in the day. A lot? <laughs> One too many? <laughs> like, what the fuck? Right. You know? Yeah, they should have a class on uh, the women of the rap gang when you, the rap community before you guys actually start Yeah, they're, they're girls waiting on you to blow up so they can blow up. With you. <laughs> oh right. Uh, speaking of blowing up, can you talk about? Uh, can you take us through remaking "Easier Said Than Done"? Um, just having fun. I did it as a um, a radio drop jingle for my man Theo. We used to be Shout at ninety two point three to be. I miss that guy so much. Yeah. I hate he quit. Um, but it was just it was it was just paying the homage. You know, I found the original sample Dre and M used, and I tried to funk it. And a lot of people dissed it. They they somebody said it was lazy. Mm-hmm. I'm like. But who can rap like Easy E anyway? Like, man, see, I don't really take no shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like a whole song, a whole song of that, gonna die. You know what though? Like, hip hop has evolved a lot, and um, obviously that record's not lazy. Obviously, it's a homage and a tribute. Mm-hmm. But I think at that point, people wanted to hear that we were still in the throes of it has to be original. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. Snoop was already at by this point having people come in and help him, but he was also like doing tributes, Lottie Slick, Dottie. Slick Rick and all that. I look at it like reggae dance hall dub style. Like let's make dub plays. Like let's like take this rhythm, dub rhyme plates. on this rhythm, take the style. What can you do with the style? Let's just make music. Word. Reggae artists take everything. They do not discriminate. Word. No, they don't. They just <laughs> they just go. Yeah, they do old school records over. Like, did not blow your mind this time. Maybe funky as shit. Right. They'll throw your record that came out last week. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> 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 They're not Jamaican. You dance to like, oh, I like this. Oh, yeah. this mine. <laughs> last week. <laughs> Got it. Can we also talk about the impact and the power um, of tonight as a single and what it means to Cali? Oh, man. Um, it's funny. That record was just, it was. That record made itself. Mm-hmm. I looped the beat, and we lived for a weekend while the beat was just on the SP twelve hundred in the in the in the kitchen nook, just mm-hmm. on repeat, banging right. We gambling on Friday night, homies is you know we pitching in. Everybody's you know bringing liquor and we getting drunk and having fun, eating hot dogs and potato chips and you know whatever it is and playing. You know I'll stop the beat to play some other music like whatever was hot. You know, in vogue. Hold on, Digital mm-hmm. Underground, Humpty Dance, stuff like that. I'd stop and jam, you know, and then I'd go back to that beat. And um, I woke, you know, I'm writing the song as I'm living it, but that hangover was fucked Ooh. up. <laughs> they brought Seagram's gin, and we used to drink gin and juice or gin and so- Super Saco. It was like this sports drink that was lemony, like a Gatorade or whatever. And we blend them together, shake them up, put them ice in a cup, and we just sip them all day long. That was the first gin and juice. And uh, I was like, I was under the impression that, dang, this first drink, I feel great. I feel good. If I drink another, I'm going to feel better. <laughs> <laughs> if I drink three, nigga, I'm going to be happy. Right. I drank four. Oh, no. <laughs> now you were dead. <laughs> <laughs> when I woke up in the morning, I thought I had the flu. Because I was just like nauseous. Like, you know how the flu knock you down? Yeah. I was like, oh, my God. How did I get the flu? The fuck is this? I try to stand up and shit my head. I'm like, whoa. Beat still playing. Mm-mm, 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 mm-mm. It's just low, turn down low, whatever. Right. No, this is real. This is really what's uh-huh. going on. So I was like, ah, oh, maybe if I eat something. Like, uh-huh. you know what I'm saying? But then I have no appetite. I was like, what the fuck is this feeling? I'm I'm 18 going on 19. Like, I'm just right on the cusp, right? Never uh-huh. had a hangover. Then my stomach started rumbling. Oh, no. I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh, this is the flu. I gotta throw up. Mm. I go in there and I Earl, and it's that it's the it's the it's, it's the dragon. That. It's all yellow. Yeah, it's, it's that, all that. It's bile. It's yeah. like I didn't know what that was. That was my first. I was like, I'm dying. <laughs> I'm finna die. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> 
So it, I get it over with. And, you know, Player Ham see me in there going through it in their, you know, toilet loving. And he came, <laughs> in the gave me some water. I'm drinking water. I'm getting the rest of it out. It's like, this, oh, this got to go. It was More a pina colada. That's what it is? Yeah. What? Because at that age, you drinking and drinking and drinking hard liquor. And you're like, nah, I don't want the hard stuff anymore. Give me that pina colada. <laughs> exactly. no, it was the Seagram's because Seagram's gin should never been made and no one should drink it. Hold <laughs> on, no, 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 that's my sponsor. They pay me. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Seagrams should it. definitely be drinking. We gonna drink. But ain't that what Petey Pablo said? Yeah, 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 yeah. And they pay me for it. And they pay me for it. <laughs> but, no, um, it was crazy because when it was over, I just jumped back up like, yeah, I'm back. Yeah, like I don't never want to go through that again though, because I wasn't gonna live until I threw up. You know, so I went in there and wrote the last 16 bars. Right, where you wow. detail all that part. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> boy, I got a headache. I need a seven up. My head is spinning. I just didn't put the vomiting part in there. I, you know, I had to have a little, you know, a little dis- uh-huh. discretion. discretion. So I ended up rapping the song as is, and it was a song about that whole weekend. Mm. You know, Friday morning. And, you know, to Sunday, like, you know, praying to God, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, wow, I'll never drink right. again. And this that was Friday night when I got the hangover. Here's Saturday night, and people had so much fun. They like, hey, man, we coming back over. Oh, God. Right. I ain't even ready. <laughs> and then as soon as the motherfuckers came, they had liquor again, different shit, beer, old English 800. And it's like, mm. what I'm going to do? Right. Same old shit. What? <laughs> how many times have you? How many times do y'all think y'all said I'm Did never I? gonna drink again? Oh, I said it a lot. I even said when I when I when I'm not drinking, like fuck, man, fuck alcohol, because you can't whoop it. It's no. like a, it's an ego thing. I be thinking like I'm gonna get tequila tonight. I'm gonna have a good time. Mm-hmm. I ain't gonna drink too much. Everything's gonna end up fine. I'm cool. I'm, In the morning, man. <laughs> I'm gonna you. give. Oh, go ahead. I'm gonna give you a tip after you. No, give us a tip now. All right. So this is what you do. Here we go. You go to the corner store. You get yourself a BC powder packet. Wait, man, my you sisters take the all BC did BC powder. powder. That shit don't work. I swear to God, it works. You take it's the BC anal- powder before your night of shenanigans. Really? You will be fine the next morning. It's just the analgesic. What? It's just an analgesic. It's like oh. aspirin. Yeah, but it's crushed up like crack. (laughs) And that means it goes through faster. Are you smoking BC powder? I'm not smoking it. How the fuck is going on here? I'm not smoking it. You just throw it. You snort it? No, I think some people do, but not me. I don't do it. I've seen people do it. I've seen people do it. Yeah, I think some people do, but it's it's, it's the best thing ever. Trust me. Anthony Bourdain said the hangover cure is uh, a joint, a Coca-Cola, and some pasta. But you got to go right after you drink. You can't do it the next yeah. morning. No, that's for the next morning. Mm. The Italians know. The Italians in the room know what's up. Yep. Pasta. Yeah, that pasta. Yeah, there, there's no better analgesic than marijuana. Yeah, it's the joint. It's, it's proven. Yeah. But, um, yeah, B, I, I take BC powder from time to time. I don't snort it. I don't snort it either. I never okay. said I snorted it. I take it, it out of my... I put it in my mouth and I try to wash it because it tastes like... It's disgusting. Monkey it's ass. disgusting, yeah. So I try to drink it down with like a Pepsi What about or Pedialyte? Coke. That's for after that, two. That's for kids. No, it ain't. That works for the hangover. Gatorade is amazing, bro. You Gatorade too. Gatorade? I was Pedialyte. staring at her Gatorade over there the yeah. whole time. I was Gatorade like, is. in case my night go crazy, I'm gonna grab that. <laughs> Wait, Word was it at your your too. dressing room that they had the package? Oh, my DJ Spinelec. Shout out to DJ Spinelec. He started putting Pedialyte on the rider, and we we started doing that before we start our night. Dope. And it's been helping out. It it's looks electric, like mud water, but it makes you feel great. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. But we still fight that damn. Alcohol demon. What is that thing? It's poison. It's exactly what it is. It's, that's it's it's clinically known as a poison. It's, it's a poison. toxin. But we are human beings and we are trying to experience everything slap, of this earthly life. Slap <laughs> slap the snake. It ain't yeah. gonna bite you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um now early, early on these albums, you start a quick groove, which I feel like is a very integral part of your production. You, um shout out to Roger Troutman. You know, man. that Mr. Troutman, rest in peace. That That's my favorite Quicks groove out of all of them. Thank you, bro. Um, but um, are you ever going to do just a Quicks groove album? People ask me that all the time. Mm. My mother wanted that before she left this earth. She was like, mm. son, your lyrics is nasty. Just do it. Your music, <laughs> your music good, though. Just do it. Hey, you said I tried. Instrumental. Right? Yeah, I try. I try to stop <laughs> cussing. But these niggas is crazy, so. <laughs> you know, so. But, um, yeah, actually, that's in the cards. But I'm just not a guy to just do beat, 10 beats. And put it on the album. Like I need all my favorite musicians to jump in and do their 
jazz thing. Like, I look at that more as like a Miles Davis undertaking than just a DJ quick thing. Yeah. Because I take that shit very seriously. Yeah, as you should. We had Tori Russell on. He's an activist from Ferguson that I met in Ferguson. Ferguson is a suburb or... Yep, I was there. I went to see Michael's... Uh, gr- um, okay, so plaque. you went. Yep. St. Louis. Yep. Um, when I said, I said, I'm interviewing DJ Quick. He's oh, man, Quick is good in St. Louis, no matter what, because right. on just like Compton, he made St. Louis feel seen and heard. We felt like this was a nigga who really understood St. Louis. Because we spent so, a lot of time there. Like, on that, that was our favorite place to go during the downtime of the tours. Mm-hmm. We had an extra three days instead of going all the way back to L.A. and then coming way all the way back out here, you know, to the Midwest. Mm-hmm. We just stay in the Midwest and kick it with some of our homeboys, you know, Big Steve, mm-hmm. Tojo, Vince. And you named some people from St. Louis on that record. Yeah, because right? we had become friends during that tour. I was out there with EPMD. And Shout uh, out to they Sermon. just showed us a lot of PMD. love, right? Yeah. And um, we just started hanging out there. Like, we were homesick. Everywhere else, nigga, was homesick back then. You know, we was kids. Yeah. Uh, but St. Louis felt like the second home, so. And yeah. then I went to, like, a sh- shooting, a clothing store, shoe store with uh, my man Gus. Mm-hmm. And Gus was like, I like this kid. And he was talking. His wife was like, no, Gus, no. <laughs> he was like, he gave me a necklace, put a necklace on me. I'm like, how much? The hair he, was like, he was like, take it. I'm like, <laughs> what you talking about, Willis? Right. Take Nothing's it. free. <laughs> He was like, take it. We took clothes and left. And I was like, I'm going to shout him out because he didn't do it for that. Mm-hmm. You know what he I mean? He made the song, yeah. And then I, we, I sent the video crew back. That video was expensive as shit, too, because we had to go to those places I mm-hmm. rapped about. So um, they went back out to St. Louis, found Gus, and, and he got a cameo in the video. If you go look at it, he came out the store with a big yeah. giant ass herringbone on. Like, he, so he, what he did was he invested in marketing by giving me that necklace because it ultimately made him like a Jacob Thanks. type. You know he was mean? the first Jacob. That's the first quick video I ever saw. It was just like Compton. Yeah. And West Coast had taken over at that point. Yeah, we were we had a run. We were on, we were, we was in it. Mm-hmm. And wasn't even looking back. Mm. And you could see the influence. I mean, now I look, you know, we got Bloods and Crips in New York. That was unheard of back then. I don't know how proud I am. I don't, I don't want to be considered like the purveyor or some shit like that. I mean, ultimately. People go where they're going to go, mm-hmm. but that just never, it never occurred to me that that would ever happen. New mm-hmm. York was New York. It was the boroughs. It was, you know, another whole way of moving. I feel like you was just documenting, though. I feel like f- f- just, and I'm not in the street life at all, but from what I could tell, the New York blood and crypt thing really comes from the jail system and the prison industrial complex. People going to de- jails, getting arrested, getting locked up, and then spending time outside of New York Getting into those, you have to protect yourself when you're in jail. So you have to get with somebody. Yeah, and then Can't you come just... back, and it just seeps into the streets. Same thing with everything. The way the, the way we wear our pants. Uh, yeah, sagging talk. sagging come from oversized jail pants. Yeah, you know because they didn't always fit you, and they didn't care. Yeah. So you just have to take shoestrings, you know, and tie the you know tie the shit up. But sagging comes from jail, absolutely. Yeah. So I need to know, how did you find out about such an underground? Hip hop group like myself and high tech, and what is it about high tech's production and my <laughs> rhymes that made you be like, I gotta support this? Uh, first of all, high tech just as a sound, the way he has a he has his own way of doing sound. Mm-hmm. It's almost like Dilla, but it's not. Mm-hmm. It's like like me meets Dilla. They were creating at the same time, just fuck out in Detroit and Cincinnati, fuck out doing sim- sampling some of the same records. It makes sense. Yeah, I just spent a, I spent the week in Detroit, drove to Cleveland, just to feel that energy, to feel the music. You know, I love I love niggas. Mm-hmm. I like to know what niggas are. Yeah, um, niggas but, is a beautiful thing. Yeah, man, man, black love. Yeah, I can't beat that shit. Yeah, you know, they cook for you. They cook big though. They cook big in Detroit. Oh, yeah. Like the egg rolls are like this. I'm like, I see why y'all so big. Y'all cook big. <laughs> Look at this motherfucker. <laughs> They was like, yeah, they they thought they got a kick out of that. Like, quick said we big because we eat big. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> man. But um, it's just the you know the whole black love thing and y'all music is it was I'm partying with uh, Kobe Bryant. Kobe mm-hmm. Bryant's got this Peace. dope ass club popping and he's debuting a new shoe and it was the shoe that looked like the Audi TT. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it was with Adidas. So we, it was like, you know, quick, you want to pull up over there? I'm like, yeah, we took a break between doing music videos. I think we was doing like Sugar Free or maybe Second and or somebody. And uh, so me and High C bail over to to the party. This shit is fly. Like, 
is balling. His shoes is everywhere and people coming in there and, and, and dropping off, you know, back then, you know, everybody used to put their CD and cassettes on mm -hmm. the bar, you know, we hitting the bar right. and, you know, um, you know, Kobe's people got a, got the hors d'oeuvres out and they're like, you know, mushroom buttons with like, you know, like devil food mushrooms and stuff. And I think the mushrooms might have been medicinal or like, okay. you know, I think they were magic. Okay. But, you know, before I even knew what a magic mushroom is. So I hit one of the mushrooms and started feeling some kind of way. And I was like, <laughs> whoa, whoa, what is this? And everybody started just being different. Like, oh, this, oh am I different? <laughs> yes. Right. You sound me. like the, the wedding or snowfall. Got me, right? You, you know, it's reflection right there in the middle of the party. I get in the car and I, I'm, I'm banging the I'm, I'm still on this cassette. I don't even know who the fuck these niggas is. I'm just like, you know, but I just had a good time at, at this party and shit. Pop that cassette in. That motherfucker said, wah, 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 wah. I turned that shit up. That shit said, I'm like, Hell yeah. I turned this <laughs> shit up. I start coming down a little bit. I realized that shit was far. I listened to it all the way through. Wow. Flipped over, you know, auto reverse, flipped over, played again. And I had to do radio the next day. Power 106, I had a radio show called The Way Too Funky Radio Show. And I was like, you know what? We got up there and we put that. I, I said, y'all dubbed this to a cart? So they remember when they had carts. Carts, yeah. They dubbed it to a cart queued it up and I had the name of it and shit. And I, you know, I was doing my show, talking shit, you know, my nigga bagging and shit, you know, Joe, we just trying to keep it light. And uh, I just told my all the listeners on the air, I said, yo, hey, I was at a Kobe Bryant party last night and I picked up this cassette and I kind of like it. I've been banging it like on repeat in my car. I said, this is Talia Kwali and Hi Chad. I think I pronounced your name right because okay. you, you pronounced my name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, you know, telling them what it was. It's like, tell me if y'all like this, y'all. This is just me, you know, digging in the craze. DJ Quick, probably, you know, KPWR, Power 106. I just, <laughs> right. boom, 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 on the air, and it just sounded good in the studio. We just yeah. sit back like, ah. about a minute later, the phone line started lighting up. Oh. Hey, cool, you want to take some calls? Yeah, I'm taking calls. Mm. Hey, yo, that shit is hard. Who is that? Hey, it's Talia Kweli Hart. They used to fuck your name up, though. They used to butcher your name. <laughs> I've but, heard them all. <laughs> I can't yeah. impress My you. My favorite is uh, Tom Lib. <laughs> no, Tom Lip Conley. Yeah, that's my I'm favorite. Gonna call you that when back the next from? time. I don't know. I'm gonna use that. <laughs> no, my, my, my favorite is back in the days. Teachers used to be like Balat, and I'm like, you're dyslexic. Oh, I mean, <laughs> say it backwards. No, they, that's now nah, they shouldn't be teaching if that's what they was oh, out man. there. Yeah, that's dyslexia. Yeah, man. Phones light up. People, um, like where could I buy that? Where could mm -hmm. I buy that? I'm like. It's on Rockets Records. I just seen that right. on the back of the cassette. It's on Rockets Records, to live quality and high tech. And when I left the station, they kept the cart. So then I heard them spin it back again later that day. And I was oh. like, ugh. But it, I didn't think of it that time. I was just being a DJ. You man, know what I mean? Thank you so much for that, man. It meant the you world. Know. You worked with Tupac on Hearts of Men, Thug Passion, and Words to My Firstborn. So obviously he meant a, meant a lot to you. Yeah. Can you. And can you tell me... Tell us the story of you getting into a fight over uh, a Tupac bootleg. Oh my God, that leaked. <laughs> well, I mean, I, yeah, I almost got killed over oh, a Tupac no. bootleg. I had a machine gun put in my face, <sighs> man. But I was still defending him. I'm like, fuck it, do what you. I just manned up, do what you got to do. Mm -hmm. This is what we say. Handle your business. I can't run. This motherfucker got thirty shots in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna just man up and take this shit. So you ain't gonna shoot me in my back. Mm -hmm. Handle your handles, bro. You know. But it was. It was in my car, and my security at the time, you know, used my car. And, uh, you know, he's a hood nigga, you know what I mean? And he took the, you know, took my car and took the CD, took the CD out and let his homeboys hear it. Let me get a copy of that. Cool. You know, but I was fancy because back then, everybody didn't have CD burners. Them mm -hmm. shit used to cost five grand. So I'm in the studio proofreading and listening to these mixes, making sure that they sound good. And I would give Suge a CD or Pac a CD. Like, you know, it was like I was a little pressing plant in that hole. That was before it was popular. Mm. Um, the CD got up, you know, it ended up in the neighborhood at Earthquake Sounds, you know, car shop or whatever. And dudes up there called um, Suge. It was like, hey, man, you know, uh, the niggas up here playing the new Tupac shit y'all in there working on. He's like, what? Mm. What? So... I get a call, hey man, come up to the to the office. And I already know them death row meetings. When they when they call you random, like 420, 
hey, fight traffic, get up here. I'm like, oh, this is going to be some bullshit. Mm-hmm. I already know. So we get up there and we confront it. And then uh, a fight started in the fucking death row. It was, it was scrapping and shit, right? So after the fight was done, my dumb ass, I'm like, man, we just got accused of something we didn't do. I'm like, what did you do, man? He's like, man, I didn't, I'm like, who did you give the seat? Man, it's this guy, right? So we go over to this guy's house. I'm like, man, let me, you know, I'm sitting up there. I'm mad because, you know, mm-hmm. niggas is like, you know, we just got into a fist of cuffs about this shit. Yeah. Um, you know, and I never shared this story before, you know, because this, this, this shit might get me into another fight. But at this point, I don't care. Um, I'm like, you know, this guy did it. So he's talking to us. He came down the street. He's talking to me and Donnell and shit, you know, about the, 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 the tape. Yeah, he didn't do it. Yada, yada, yada. Somebody else did it. So... Me and my infinite wisdom, I take off on him. Like, I'm just, I'm, you know, it's some bullshit. I got to fight somebody because we just got into a fight over here. You don't know what just happened. So I fight the dude, and uh, he dropped his Hennessy. And I think he was more mad they dropped his Hennessy than, than the, you know, me actually swinging on him or whatever. So he told his homeboy, he said, man, blast this motherfucker. And my man just pulled out a tech. I just cold. Mm. Like, mm. oh, I'm dead over this dumbass Tupac tape. Mm. Right? So my man didn't shoot me. My security got the gun from him. It's like, y'all just go head up. So I'm fighting with this guy. You know, then I end up fighting with the other guy. And the other guy kicked me all in the head and shit. I'm on the ground getting stomped and shit. I get up and I'm still fighting this guy. And it's like, man, I can't fight, bro. Help me fight these motherfuckers. Why you got me out here fighting two people? You know what I'm saying? Right. So, and then we had to go to a party that night still, oh, like a Whispers God. party that Death Row was throwing. So we end up at the Whispers party and shit. And he's like, wow. You know what I'm saying, man? Boo wham. You all right? You all right? Yeah, we cool. We cool. You know what I'm saying? He was like, no, nah, y'all not cool. Y'all need to go to the house. No, nah, we cool. Fuck it. It's charged to the game. But it was, it was supposedly the guy that did it. I ended up making amends with him. I went and hung out with him a couple of years ago mm-hmm. and apologized, you know, because I shouldn't have did that. Um, but, you know, it was... Um, you know, Death Row was the single most dangerous record company in the world. But if you had on the chain, nothing ever happened to you. It was like an amulet. <laughs> yeah, we had a DOC on, and he said that— Good luck charm. Uh, yeah, DOC wow. said he, he, he said that Death Row for him was more volatile than being locked up in jail. Because there was a lot of guys that was locked up in jail working for Death Row. Yeah. You know? Um, you had a deep, long relationship with Suge Knight before Death Row Records, though, right? Yeah. Um, at some point, and ev- your beef with MC8 was very famous. Everybody in hip-hop knew about it. Um, but at some point, you decided the Source Awards to perform this record, Dollars and Cents. Yeah. Can you walk me through what was going on in your mind or what you felt like you had to do? Wasn't nothing going on in my mind. Mm. We was happy to be at Madison Square Garden. Dr. Dre, DJ Pooh, it was like, I'm with the greats. Like, right. I made it. Right. You know, but I'm going to do Dollars and Cents because that's the song that's the hottest right now that I got. Is You know, the Murder Was a Case soundtrack is blowing mm. up. So we just decided to do it. But beforehand, while we were sound checking, I could see on the seats whoever, mm. where everybody was sitting. Mm-hmm. And I saw his seat. I was like, oh, I'm going to surprise him. Just come out with it. Right. You know what I mean? And we had this all in the, you know, the little cells and shit. And Tupac was supposed to be there, but he was under arrest at that point. Sure, right. was already working to get him out. We didn't know this. So they got a, a paper cut of cut out of him in the cell next to me and you know Lady of Rage just like this is a thing you yeah. know death row it was spectacular image. the way it was presented thank you yeah um, but when I came you know Dre edited it and put it in the show and when I the way he edited it was just dope I had my little one verse I came out hair I had to keep my hair like that the whole time because nobody in New York did hair like that so That's I had right. to keep my shit together for four days <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> imagine that you can't sweat because soon as you sweat that shit get buff. <laughs> You know what I mean? You go back to nigga head. You know, it's like the, you, you know, sleep like a, like, a, like, a, like, a, like a black girl. Like, yes. Exactly. Like a black queen. Yeah, they, say, they say sleep pretty. Yeah. Yeah, they, they can sleeping on the hands. But um, I kept it together, right? And uh, when I came out to perform it, the lights was in my eyes. So I couldn't see him. And that was the thing. I couldn't, mm-hmm. like, I wanted to, like, wrap it directly to him. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know what I mean? It was just, it was dramatic. We was just drawing up. And plus, these niggas got my back, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Death Row was, yeah, <laughs> as big at the get... time. Yeah. Death Row um, was huge. MC8, uh, we had him on this show. Uh, he, after we had him on this show, he asked me to be on his uh, record. I did a record with him. Dope. Um, you, um, you said several times on this program, on this show, that you did not see yourself as a gangster. And then 
a couple years after that, you did Use a Gangster where mm-hmm. you really addressed all this stuff. Yeah. And I was guilty by association. Mm-hmm. Like the, the funny thing on my first album, my neighborhood was called Treetop Pyru, mm-hmm. but my production company was called Total Track Productions. And they put the logo on my album. I said, don't do that, y'all. This is going to be, really? no, man, we promoting Total Track Productions. I'm like, do, 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 So that wasn't bum. supposed to be that way. No, it wasn't. That's crazy. I thought this Everybody whole time. thought I was repping TTP. That's me too. Mm. It's Total Track Productions. It's okay. Tracy and Courtney's production company. I'm like, can y'all just put the That's name? That's crazy. Right. Just spell it out. You thought that too, That's right? That's nuts. Absolutely. The irony. <laughs> the fucking irony so, right that my neighborhood would have the same <laughs> pentagram as these motherfuckers. Label. We got my man Radio Raheem in here because I'm going to uh, interview him later, but you actually worked for Death Row at some point, right? Yeah, man. And I'm listening yep. to him recount his story, and I'm remembering my little pieces of these moments. Yeah. I mean, it was small. I'm a teenager. I'm trying to come over <laughs> doing uh, you know, PA work when this guy was doing his thing. I'm right. in high school listening to these tracks like they're iconic to me. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Man. Um, but yeah, I think he was a gangster. Up, we, yeah, he was a gangster. I was just trying to distance myself. I wanted to go pop, I, mm-hmm. you know, because... You know, no, I'm not. All, it's gangster. No, I'm not. It's all fun. You're very, very literal in that record. It's all fun <laughs> and games until every concert gets shot up. Mm. So it got to a point to where I stopped touring because every concert was getting shot up. We 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 would have to pick and choose when to wear the bulletproof vest, when we needed extra guns, extra guys to get us out of the back. We had to draw the plans. They had to know what the topography is of the building, the ways in, the ways out. Is it multiple ways? These guys might come from it. It was just, just a whole, that, just, that was just weird. It was like, you know, it's like, why? You know, we get shot at, and it got to a point to where we was getting shot at so regularly that if the gunshots wasn't that close, we didn't move that fast. Wow. Mm. Start getting numb to it. Man, but I think it's it's <laughs> crazy because with such a gangster record like Dollars and Cents and some of your earlier music, mm-hmm. I would posit that doing you as a gangster where you're like, no, I'm not, and actually I'm not like that, is more brave than any of those gangsters. That's records. what Shaka Khan said. She said, this dude's got balls. That's the brave record. Yeah. Yeah. Because everybody will come at your head. Mm-hmm. It's like, but it was an act. Like, Easy e wasn't a crip. Mm-hmm. You know, y'all don't even talk about that. But them niggas right. was Crip neighborhood, Kelly Park Crip. They didn't play. They just played up the gangster. My shit was, it was because, I learned later, this is what the ladies told me. Mm-hmm. They said it was because you were fly. Mm. That motherfuckers knew you was a blood. They was like, because blood niggas be fly. I'll be wearing these slick clothes and shit. You know, I always be a Sergio Dakini sweatsuit wearing nigga. You know right. what I mean? Went from khakis to t- Sergio Dakini. Come on, man. And, <laughs> and fucking Diodora. Like, you yeah. know what I mean? We was going there. Lotto and shit when that shit was hot, you know? Shout out to Raekwon. He resurrected the Diodora brand. You bet that. Yeah. You know, so, you know, just that was it. And I flew my hair out, you know what I mean? To be mm-hmm. different. That was my androgyny, Prince. Mm-hmm. He like Prince, like, fuck it. He, he said fuck it and did it. You know, right. everybody else had, you know, froze or jerry curls. I did the pressing curl the first time just to mm-hmm. be different. You know what I mean? Right. But, um, you know, I have my jerry curls and all that shit too. But it was just something about flying your shit out back then that that's just set you apart. And girls liked it. I did it right. for the girls. But, you know, being... You know, people just getting out. It's like, even though I wasn't from Treetop Paru per se, that I, you know, moved on, it was like, no, you automatically gonna be this. We're gonna typecast you. I was just typecast, mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. what I mean? As a gangbanger, which is the most dangerous typecaster. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> you, know? you can't typecast in a way to make people wanna test you. Yeah. Um, you came all with, the time. You came with uh, rhythmalism, and that to me was all about growing up. Are we still party, but we have to grow up now? Uh, no doubt you say I'm older than the motherfucker you know what I'm saying mm-hmm. uh, Hand in Hand is such a beautiful beautiful record and it, records aren't supposed to be beautiful in hip hop it's beautiful they? there's a lot of beautiful Word. No, records you can in say hip-hop. that like, I mean yeah, yeah. there's a lot of beautiful be, hip hop it's because records. Elder Barge made that shit gorgeous yeah man that's what I wanted to ask you about my Talk favorite to me about motherfucker man. Elder Barge and your relationship with him. my music. favorite motherfucker man I, I, I know I didn't finish your Tupac question because it was a lot of shit that it went it went back from there Tupac found out that I fought these niggas over his tape I mean over his shit getting leaked mm. and he loved me infinitely of for course that. and we we just started we was two peas in a pod we hung we did so much shit together we used to hang out and film it and just I just took it for granted 
Like, he going to be here always. You know, right. he out of jail now, and he going to stay out, and it's fine. We finna, we gave him the best record in the world, All Eyes on Me. We yeah. sat there. I didn't even leave the studio. Usually I go home, you know. I sat there like 48 hours mixing them shit, smoking BDs when they was brand new, whatever that Beaties, shit was. bro. I just posted oh, a picture of myself those. on my friends that were smoking BDs. You know, Khalil's BDs, that's what they was called. They was banned after 9-11 because the company that was distributing them had ties to Bin Laden. Mm-hmm. That's why we stopped smoking beaties. Fuck those, yeah. Uh, those are those, those little, <laughs> little skinny, pink skinny cigarettes. Joints, and little right? pink, yeah. It was, it was spices. Like, it was clove leaves. Clove, or it was like the a, clo- with a, with the a little next thing string on it. Yep. Like the clove's cousin. You get sick, you get a head rush. Yeah, the motherfucker, the first time I hit it, I hit the wall. Boom. Me too. Because you got to say this ain't a blunt. I went down on my knee. I went down on the knee like, what the fuck <laughs> is this Fucking shit? Fucking beaties, bro. Got me. But yeah, word up. We yeah. stayed in there, knocked that shit out, man. He was just, he worked so fast. Mm. But we was, we, then we toured. We did mm. a short little tour. We was in Louisiana, um, uh, New Orleans theater, I mean, uh, arena, mm-hmm. killing that shit, man. And mm. then he got mad at me and wanted to fight me because I jumped on the speakers. And he was like, you're still in my show. He told Shug, he's still in my fucking show. He's still in my shit. I'm like... <laughs> Bro, we been jumping on speakers, dude. <laughs> and I got that from Bobby Brown. Right, you ain't the only nigga to jump on a speaker. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like Bobby. So funny argument. Voice. I was the first rapper to jump on speakers. Fucking speakers. <laughs> yeah, no, Pac, he was incensed then. Instead of us fighting, what Suge would have us do is, or he wouldn't have us do it, but he he wasn't opposed to it. We'd just go to the weight room and lift it out. Yes. You know what I'm saying? We'd be in the weight room. You know, his homies Healthy looking at you. Man. Then Pac get on it. He hitting that motherfucker. Boom, boom. It's like, if you lift more than somebody you want in the fight, basically. I like man, that. I beat, him. I beat him. I got like, it's like three okay. more in. I think we had like a hundred and something. Right. You solve the issue and you get swole. I like it. Yeah. And then it was, it never happened. It was back yeah. cool. Yeah, but I like God, that. I miss him. It was, he should be such, he should so be here. Him and Eric, he would have been doing movies right now. Like he'd have been, Black Quentin Tarantino, he'd have been Sam Jackson. Like he, he would mm. be doing every, he'd be doing the same shit Ice Cube did with all I mean, the yeah, fucking I mean, Fridays. Twenty five, he was taken from 25, us. Twenty five, bro. You don't even, man. You barely, you don't even have a great pubic hair at twenty five. Like what right. the fuck? Great pubic hairs. <laughs> ah, just too young. Sorry, <laughs> fuck my analogy. It's just water. No, I love, no, I love, I love well, that analogy. Does, uh, Dave Chappelle makes talks about great pubic hairs. That's why. I'm <laughs> <laughs> I love. Thank you for introducing me to David Chappelle too. Uh, when did I do that? You took me to the Chappelle show when I came out to New York. Oh, when okay, I moved okay, there. okay, yeah. That's right. You was in New York. We was going to clubs a little bit. I was having fun with yeah, you that too. Was a good I was like, I'm with Kweli. Kweli. I used to kill it. Used to go on fucking High 97 and freestyle for like three, four minutes of that just freestyle pure. that you talking about. I just posted that recently. You're a bad motherfucker, oh, man. No, I, was, I was sitting in the hotel going, woo. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you know you like something, nigga. No doubt, no doubt. And was today today's the first time that you found out that he felt like you push started his career with playing. That That's record? crazy. Yeah, it just fucked me up. I'm still I'm a, I'm a, I'm a laminate on it later, but mm. yeah, man, I had no idea that I meant that I did that much. No, you I were very very important part of my story. You serious? Yeah, very important part. Of I, my hey, story. man, I watch you rise, man. I watch you meet EQ. Like, I watch. You, yeah, you made you watch me meet EQ too. That's watch right. everything, <laughs> bro. <laughs> you were there for everything. Is that? <laughs> 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 I'm your fairy godbrother. That's right. I like that. Oh. <laughs> Not fairy, though. It's nothing wrong with fairies. We love fairies. All right. We don't play pause on people's part. Pause. Yes. Now we do that all the time, too. Pause. <laughs> um, recently, online in particular, I feel like Sugar Free has been experiencing a resurgence. Word. I feel like people who maybe weren't there when he was first making yeah. a name for himself are really starting to understand uh, how important Sugar Free was to the game. And, uh, right. you know, why are you bullshitting such an important record Man. for the culture? Uh, Do I Love Her is, I just played that at the Blue Note. I was playing that for my friends at the Blue Note. They was like, is this some new quick Sugar Free? I'm like, nah, y'all just slept on this one. Mm. You know it what I'm saying? Right under the radar. So, Man. what is it about Sugar Free that from Quick's perspective, mm-hmm. the inside track that makes people love him so much. Um, Sugar Free is like if Morris Day was your uncle. <laughs> He's that animated. He's he he leaves it all on the stage too. Mm-hmm. It's like he's cathartic when he's on stage. 
you know, and he's he's you know he's not a bad looking guy. So it's like it it lends to, you know, to the you know to his show, mm-hmm. and he's talented. He's got this crazy voice, this crazy cadence, and he talks this fucking wild shit. But why I love him is because he he went to the goat like we all did. If you don't if you ain't stealing from Richard Pryor, you're not funny. Mm. This motherfucker, <laughs> we just studied Richard Pryor all our whole lives. I scratched Richard Pryor on every album that I did. That makes sense. Tupac's I didn't make that album. connection. He's Richard Pryor. Yeah. He lo- he acts like Richard Pryor. He talks like him. So it's just yeah. always light, you know? And the beautiful thing is, is that, you know, his touring has changed to where, you know, it, it was just a local thing. Like, you know, he be here he'd be at the bar and grill he'd be there now he's starting to get respected he did a yeah. lot of shows for a little bit of money to be able to build up the you know how touring is mm-hmm. you got it's a momentum it's a ball it's rolling down the hill peaks. when you stop yeah when you stop you lose all that momentum mm-hmm. so he's just been pounding it he's hitting everywhere he got his money up and he's he's he's, he's got a perpetual career touring and these records are starting to, like you said, have a resurgence. And I'm glad because if anybody deserves that, it's him because he works so hard. I call that nigga Morris Knight. Morris Knight. Not Morris Day, Morris Knight. Morris Knight. That's hilarious. That's his whole shit. And he's worked, these <laughs> he's worked with all these guys. He's worked with Morris Day. You know what I'm saying? He's worked with pretty much, you know, it's it's he's he's our best kept little secret. You know what I mean? It's it's not for everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and the Source magazine, they they did an interview, and I thought they was going to give us a whole lot of love, and they did until they asked. They said, you know, and it was like, who's, you know, such a monumental neighborhood record we went. So, um, you know, it didn't really sell much. It only sold, like, you know, 200,000 copies. Uh, how do you feel about that? It's like, bro, at least it sold that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At least that many people actually bought it. And if that many people buy it, ultimately, at some point, it's going to plaque. As a record deal guy, my record dealer, mm-hmm. it's gonna do something. But it's it's starting to like break out of just the West Coast. Like I took him to Denver, mm-hmm. and motherfuckers were thrown. They were taken aback that he was actually in Denver, and he in Denver killing it. Yeah, like he whatever stage he get on, it's a, it's a thing. He's a, it's like it's like vaudevillian. I'm a, it's like a it's like a stage play. And on top of all of that, with all of that presence, there's still for me as a lyricist. There's still the bars and the styles. Say it's that. still you haven't even got to that part. He's saying and he's saying some real shit. Yeah, he's the king of the one liners. That's what me and like AMG all of us say. Like it's a, his, it's like watching a stand up act, but a, like a really exactly fast, intricate, rhythmic, funky ass stand up. I remember just recently I saw on the internet he did a commercial for a soul food spot. <laughs> Have you seen this? Yes. Yo, that <laughs> shit was incredible. And it's like you know. They didn't, they are soul food spot in the hood. So they have the same level of production as a soul food spot in the hood would have. Like on Friday after next, it's so good, make you want to slap your mom and look like that shit, but it's star and sugar free. And he's eating his favorite sandwich or his favorite, uh, that shit was great. Classic. Um, You mentioned Mossberg Mm -hmm. earlier and I never got to meet the bro, Um, but he blew me away on Change the Game. And I said to you, uh, balance and options. This is, this was a, a, you've taught me so many lessons. I've shared a couple with you before. I remember when we first started hanging out and I said to you, man, that Balance and Options is such a good album. Thank you. And I really like it and meant the world to me. And at that time in your life, you said, really? I don't like it. I didn't. And I was like, why don't you like it? And you were like, because I did all this work to make this brilliant, conscious. And nobody liked it. Nobody cared. Right. You it said none of it. didn't even go gold. That was I a lesson drop for me. I from from that shit. That was a lesson for me because he, I'm coming from a fan level and I, it, it really, it, it changed my outlook, the way I looked at music that album did that for me. Word. So to speak to the creator and you're like, nah, like uh, Raheem, I'm a, mm-hmm. I keep, he, he's in my eyesight. So I keep thinking of shit that he said, but he has a show. He interviewed Jon Stewart Dope. and on his show, John Stewart, he asked John Stewart about his time at The Daily Show. And John Stewart said, I was on The Daily Show for 20 years. And I feel like not only did I not help, but I might have added to the problem. Because here we are now, Fox News is bigger than ever. We didn't stop Trump from coming in. He feels like all that work, he feels like he just became a part of the show rather than actually making a change. And I feel like that's the same way you felt with Balance and Options. See, you saw more than that. You had better foresight or hindsight than I did mm. because my thing was it was about numbers at that point mm. and I didn't have that tonight on there I didn't have a sweet black pussy I didn't have a born and raised in Compton or you know mm-hmm. I was coming from a more rhetorical 
point of view on that record. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to just say something musically. And it had breaks in it and cuts and like, you know, it was programmed in such a way um, that it was, you know, it was disjointed in a sense. And then, you know, Tupac died, like, I mean, Tupac, but he died five years before that. But then Mossberg died and it was like, it was hard to promote it because I'm just listening to Mossberg. He's on so many of the songs too. You know what I mean? He He was so dope. It was just like, it was like, I don't know. It's like the, I don't want to say that on your podcast, but it was like, it was the ostracized album in a sense. Mm. You know what I mean? And even though my eyes are clear on that cover, clear as fuck and a deer, um, I was hurt. Mm. I was just, it's so much pain behind that. that pain. Even the, the thought of it, like I'll never do another balance and options. And I, mm. It's just wrong how that, how that ended up where I'm, you know, like I'm ostracizing one of my records, like psh, you know, get mm. like, you know, I don't want to fuck with it. I, I but the only song I do off of it is uh, I do pitching on the party and do I love her, do I need her. But it's hard to listen to, you know, it's hard to listen to that shit because of what was going on at the time. You know, all the turmoil in the streets, all of the, the you know, the death row stuff, all of mm. the the gang shit, all of the tax shit, all of the you know, industry changing and these people doing this and people moving in and you know, what I mean, it's like nobody cares anymore. Like we're the, you know, I was the old thing at that point. Mm. You know, even though I was still in my twenties. Yeah, it's yeah. Really no, I mean, hip hop is a young man's game, and and um, it's 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 a shame, really, because imagine telling your elders, it's you over, it's time to sit down." But that's what hip hop does. Yeah, and they do it unshamedly, unabashedly, when no other genre does that. Mm-hmm. Look at Big Jacker now, and I hate to use him as an example, but you think you would ever see them in the verses, like <laughs> right. rock and roll guys? Right. Why do we do that to ourselves? Why do we challenge each other to to the duel of the death, to the duel to death? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's it's not having. It's coming from a place of not having. Um, but even with Pitching on a Party, which is an amazing record, it is. It stood the test of time. It's still funky. What's great about that record is you're saying, look, at that point you were transitioning. Yeah, I'm like, no more tonight. Right. We're, now y'all got to start paying you for got this right. shit. <laughs> y'all shooting up my parties. Right. You know what I'm saying? I'm y'all fucking up shit. I got. Baby blue carpet. Right. Why y'all want to smoke blunts and cigarettes in here on the carpet? <laughs> right. You can go outside. Look at this big cigarette burning my carpet. Take your shoes off. <laughs> Somebody to kick the extension cord out there. And that's when it. That's when you know it's fucked up. When niggas try to go find a place to kick to take a chick uh-huh. and go kick the music. <laughs> <laughs> the lights and all that shit was in the same plug. Man. So, <laughs> <laughs> Man, people, man, people Tripping do crazy over shit. Extension cord. People do crazy shit on alcohol. What was it like working with Raphael Sadiq on Well and with Tony Tony Tone? And can you talk about the impact of Let's Get Down? Ray is a phenom. He's just a different kind of musician mm-hmm. from a different era. I feel like I feel like sometimes his his magical yacht. <laughs> dropped him off here and went back into outer space because he's mm. like he's from the 60s he's civil right he's like he's like you know he's more akin to like a Malcolm X type you know what I mean that mm. shit but in music like the Temptations he's that the Four Tops um, and he could make it in any genre in any era he could be born in any era and still be like the number one artist it's, he's just a phenomenal dude you know what I mean like the way he writes even without writing sometimes, the way he conceptualizes records is just wild. Like that's, that's, he's like the Tupac of R&B basically. Mm. Cause he could just talk about anything and do anything and it all makes sense. And he's got this fucking angelic voice that how the fuck can you not like that voice? You know? Yeah. It's one of the greatest voices. Um, We just interviewed Ali Shaheed Muhammad and he's told us some amazing stories about Ray. Man. And just his impact is so important. I just ran into him in London too, a few months ago. He introduced me to Leon Ware. Wow. Leon Ware came to a studio and uh, he said, quick, just check this out. And Leon started playing his music and his music was so beautiful that Leon was turning around and like just smiling to himself like, <laughs> I got him. I got him. Like, <laughs> then he turned back around and be normal, but just to see him over there giggling. Off of, yeah. But his music, it was like listening to a new I Want You, Marvin Gaye. Look, look, I'm getting chills. That mm. motherfucking Leon was just shitting. And Ray just let him have the studio. Like, Ray was fly. Like, Ray introduced me to D'Angelo, and we didn't do music. We played basketball. D'Angelo mm. slam dunked and put balls in my face and shit. Oh, my God. <laughs> we can't say stuff like that because we all think of D'Angelo as. <laughs> 
No, no, I'm just saying. He, mm-hmm. She's yes. thinking he, he, was, he wasn't naked when he was playing basketball. I know, but I'm saying, like, I know he wasn't naked, but he's saying putting balls in my face, oh, and no, that's what we think is He didn't play with his How Does It Feel outfit on. <laughs> I mean, he did. He had on clothes. But, I mean, you know, we go, know. We go we pick, don't know. A, we we wasn't there. We did a pickup game of basketball. <laughs> and my man was like slam dunking like on the niggas like bro like you think this nigga play guitar and sing uh-huh. you know and, and and piano this motherfucker's dunking the ball and shit with jewelry on and <laughs> <laughs> wait you know like, what I just thought of damn, game Dundee? blouses <laughs> exactly that's exactly what it is oh he said it's how does he shit. feel outfit <laughs> <laughs> is that bad? No, that's good. He's gonna be mad at me. Is no, that? he's gonna love it. He's gonna love well, it. Well, he'll come on the show and clear it all up. Yeah, we gotta definitely get Rafael Sadiq on the show. Definitely. Yeah, no, Ray. Um, he didn't have to do that for me because they was already double platinum. They was fresh off of Sons of Soul album, and Ray was my wish list because I fell in love with Anniversary and Lay Your Head on My Pillow and and my girlfriend's my ex girlfriend's a hoe. That mm-hmm. album just it just stayed in my yeah, both it's of a my, classic. And I would take it out. This I bought two CDs so I wouldn't have to keep switching it from mm-hmm. the. The you know the the fucking Range Rover basically to the fucking Lexus or Mercedes. Oh. Um, Listen up, kids. And, that's and, what you just have to do. Uh, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I uh, asked my boy G One George Archie, the drummer. I asked George if you know because he was he he was friendly with them. Um, if you know we could like get together and do something like if he would be down with that because I know I'm at that point I was mo pussy <laughs> just because I didn't say it, I don't want the fuck right don't mean that I don't want we was doing records like that right and I'm like how can you blend that with you know do you know what today it's, it's got to be a way some of this could work right y'all so found that sweet spot we went to Michael Jackson studio we went to mm. Westlake it was in the D room you know Michael Jackson tap room and um. We started cutting the record there, and he started chumming around on the um, on the guitar, and I started just programming the drums and working on the bass line. I had my little Yamaha synthesizer and my MPC three thousand, and I'm just and he. So I laid down some vocals and I did those three verses, right? Like it was like we'll change the arrangement, do eight bar verses instead of sixteen. I'll make the song long, make it an R and B record where he gets the sixteens and you just get eight, and the music changed for you, and it changed to a beat that was similar to just like Compton. If you, if yeah. you, you know, the yeah. minor ninths. That's Curtis Mayfield all day long. That's um, give me your love, do 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 do. Minor ninths. Uh, shout mm. out to um, uh, shout out to his bass player, Lucky Scott. That's that Lucky Scott shit and Robert Bacon. But um, we ended up doing that, and we put it, this was the beginning of Pro Tools. We went from the reel to reel, the, the, you know, the Studer mm-hmm. 48 track, put it to Pro Tools, and Ray just took a drive with him. And I was like, like what's he going to do with this? I mm-hmm. played percussion. I, I went and bought percussion to start playing. That's when I learned how to play percussion. I'm playing all the flexi tones on that, the, you know what I'm saying, all the triangles and all. I know I'm long-winded this, but it's a, no, it's no, a long good. session. Um the um the song went to Ray and he took it home and edited it and cut, took it to the studio, cut it and put it back on tape, which was a flex to print it back. So he's a, a technical motherfucker too. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. Put it back on tape, sent it back to me, and it was so good and so much shit happening that we had to go book one of the best studios in the city. So I booked Skip Sailor, who Skip I had Sailor, platinum, yeah. platinum success with before. Well, quick as a name and AMG's bitch better have my money. I um went and booked his big studio where, you know, where, you know, Guns N' Roses worked mm-hmm. and Katie Lang and, you know, and the Rolling Stones. And I was in there using their settings. Rolling Stones used to put up settings on EQs mm-hmm. and I would pop it into a track to see just how, what it sounded like. That shit was sweet as bear meat. That's so, the sweetest bear meat. <laughs> come on, man. Bro, I mixed that record. It took, that was the longest record it ever I ever mixed. It took two whole 12-hour sessions to mix that record. Usually you mix records in five hours. What know? kind of board was? was It was um, a SSL 100 input G plus with automation. Hmm. Million dollar board. Yeah. They had to tear the wall out to put it in yeah. and then rebuild the wall. Behind it when it was in. I just recently Fuck yeah. went back to uh um, and roll to because I used to do that in that era. We would go. My first records were on that tape, and after that, when it started becoming more about the Pro Tools and stuff, I started making sure I'd be like, make sure we put it back on the tape. But okay. I fell out of that habit just out of convenience. But do you feel the difference in the songs? I do now 
when the mixes when you're doing the shows. When you're doing live, there's doing a, there's, live. A, there's an element that's missing. Yeah, I went back to Electric Lady recently on this album I'm working on with Mad Lib just to be like, yo, we need to just I need to hear it through these speakers. I want to run it through this board. I want to get back into making sure that we have that aspect. Yeah, that aspect that you put that element back in your music. Yeah. Because once it's gone, it's gone. It's almost like taking the sugar out of something. Mm. You're gonna miss that sugar. Mm-hmm. And yeah. what you're missing is Right, because them oh, gluten free. I was just about to say the gluten. We need the gluten. Whatever <laughs> gluten is, I need it. <laughs> bro, bro, it don't it's, crunch it's, the it's same. It's, there's, <laughs> there's a magic that happens that we don't know about that happens with tape. Magnetic tape is magnetic, and it's electricity, and it's it's electricity that reforms the shape of you know just the, the, it lines all the molecules up to be what they are. Mm -hmm. But while it's doing all that technical shit, it's also picking up the energy in the room, your vibrations as a mm. human being, how you're feeling, and it attracts itself to the tape as it's going around. So you're recording energy too, vibe mm. in the room. Yeah. You hear me? And if there's a party in the room, it gets on the tape. Yeah. Stains it. Like that carpet I was telling you about earlier. <laughs> that baby Seriously. blue carpet. Yeah. Dead ass. Yeah. That's what you're missing. Tape, um, digital doesn't do it. It's just O's and ones. It's just lining up what it hears. Tape, and it also compresses all of the sound. So it gives you the automatic boom bap naturally because it automatically knocks it back so it could be so it could be turned back into an audible sound because mm -hmm. it's just electricity and magnetism and particles. But when when they all line up, it's like the fucking planets lining up. It becomes something like cosmic. It becomes a thing that lasts forever. Yeah. That's what you're missing. It's the second harmonic distortion. For every kick you put on there, and kicks like usually hit at 100 hertz, it'll record 50 hertz and 200 hertz at the same time. So your kick is three times as powerful when it comes back. And snares. And your vocals. You sound like three people instead of one. Mm. So it's just, yeah, this it's is your super friend hologram. <laughs> right, right. I Go ahead. Okay, I just want to give you a shout out real quick because I put it in our group chat. The way that you sit and you explain and you're so excited to share information. Nice I have shit. a friend that's a DJ, DJ Artistic. Shout out to him. Yep. Um, you commented to him on Twitter and he was asking you about a beat and you literally broke the I whole saw this thing down. And he was I said a master class for free 99. And about he was claps. so excited. We still part that's your boy? That's my homie. Tell that's that my nigga, we gotta have a drink. Oh. And I, tell him I, I show him how to do that shit live in his face. He can do that he's shit in his He's going to be apartment. so upset. I invited him today when I saw that, but he's in Jersey uh, DJing the NAACP. But, you know, The fact that he mentioned that song, We Still Party in Those Claps, that's me and my nephews in the shower. Like, yeah. we, we wanted the claps to sound like more bouncing an ounce, but they had reverbs. And I'm thinking, you know, on that record, I'm thinking, there's natural reverb in this bag. It's all tiley and shit. And at this point, I got into how Herb Alpert did all his recordings at A&M. They made these hanging rooms these these you know these reverbs naturally and they just mic them so i'm like that's kind of what the bathroom is it's mm -hmm. one of the you know because i was at Warner, i was at you know I was at a and m a lot mm -hmm. henson and um i would go and look at the mic like how they got these rooms and they just sound so beautiful this this bathroom was the same thing so i put the microphone in the bathroom turn it around so it could get you know because mics are early reflection late reflection room noise how it works we sat behind the shit way far and just start clapping, pow. And the ring would go, the, the 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 sound would attack the mic first and the sound would go behind it. It was like, you know, Doppler effect. And when I went back in there, let's see what that sounds like. And I went back in there, that shit was in there going, clack, blah. I'm like, it's over. It's the greatest shit I ever did. And I just did it on the idea. You, you know, know, I DJ now, right? God, thanks, sometimes. Thank God for weed, huh? Oh, thank God for weed. <laughs> <laughs> Amen, Lord. I, I DJ now sometimes, and um, one of my go-to records is that Herb Albert, Rise. And the reason that's one of my go-to records, beyond it being the Biggie sample, is because it gives me a, a space to just relax and figure out what I'm going to play next because of those claps. It's a whole audience. Pow! Pow! Like that. And so now that you're telling me this story, I'm like, this is why it does that. Yeah, man, claps, per, uh, that's the most coolest percussion that you could do for anybody. You, that Claps are really made of applause. They're just applause put to music. Yeah. Imagine yes. that. Yes, indeed. Now, you mentioned unsung earlier. Um, and some people don't want to do unsung while they still work. You're a young man. You look right. very young. You've got uh, very I, I young energy. I should have done it, but P. Frank Miller talked me into it. That's a good guy. You should do it. You should do yeah. it. You know, you're crazy quick. You should just do it, man. You know, 
Uh, I'm crazy in a good way, right? Is it just crazy, <laughs> crazy, or is it crazy? You know, man, just do the shit. So I did it, but my song is supposed to be a movie. It's supposed to be two hours long because it was so much. We just skipped over everything. Mm. Just went right to, I went to jail. Because, <laughs> you know, yeah. they like the dark shit yeah. on uh, mm-hmm. TV One. Clicks and views. Um, Clicks well, and views, clickbait. Yeah, well, I mean, you have so much more to tell, and I'm sure there's a Bro. movie or a book or something. You're an MC, right? Yes, I am. How can I be unsung when I'm still singing? Hey, that's a bar. You and MC too, turns out. Brother. Word. No, I like, I like rapping. I know. You're good at it, too. <laughs> hey, you're one of the greatest to ever do this stuff, Oh, man, bro. come on, man. Coming from come you. Come on, man. For real. Easily. Sound, the best sound. Like, you you remind me of, like, what Rafael Sadiq is to R&B. You're that to rap. Oh. That's you know, a heavy what compliment. What Cube Tip is, well, like, you're in that world. I'm definitely, when it comes to this, and this is, my real father is a great man, but when it comes to this music and this MC, and I'm Q-Tip's son, and that's my mentor in this. Really? Absolutely. I never knew that. Absolutely. I but mean, I, I was on that last Tribe Called Quest album because I was just... That Tribe Called Quest album is amazing. Yeah, man. That, that yeah. Thank you for your service. I sat there and watched him create that at the crib, bro. So and good. And it's like, I had to, I had a, a saw me and Q-Tip were working on for years. And you know who Tip is. He's, you know, it could be hard to reach sometimes. Yeah. Fife passed away. And so I was like, okay. Yeah, rest, rest in peace, peace, Fife. Fife. Um, in my mind, I'm like, I'm never going to ask him about that song again. You know what I'm saying? Who am I to be like, what's up with that song? Yeah, that that is there's no place for that. There's yeah. no respect in that. And so I ran into him and I'm just talking to him. He's like, yo, we never he brought finished. it up. He brought it up. That's how that's a real hip hop. That's a he's a purveyor of hip hop. That's yeah. that's a kind of story. That's and I said, I said, okay. He said, come over to the crib. I said, it's nothing. I went over to the crib and him and Jerobi in there working on that album. And they had all the fife vocals. And I'm like, what, what the fuck is this? What is this? I had no idea that they were even making it. But I watched them go through that. I watched them, and they, I was around when they went on Saturday Night Live through all, all that. And man, yep, yep, they promoted the, that album good. That was like that was one of the last good movements in hip hop music yeah. pr- uh, promotion. Um, my style. I bought that album. It's a great album. I'm glad to be a part of it. My style is built on my lyrical style is built on Q-Tip and by extension Native Tongues. Fuck yeah, KRS One, Chris, and Ice Cube. <laughs> Ice Cube is one of the great. He's top three greatest rappers of all time. People won't say Absolutely. that. Absolutely, and you got to work Rakim with him. Rakim is in that three. Oh yeah, Rakim. It's a tight little list. That's my. That's yeah. like Pluto and his moon sharing. Mm-hmm. It's like it's little. It's a little <laughs> ass list. Word <laughs> up. But tell me about working with Ice Cube on a song. It's, that you did. It, it, Ice Cube is first of all, I'm too much of a fan to, to enjoy it like I should because I, I just want to impress him. Because he impressed all of us so long. You just want to impress people. Mm-hmm. And let's back up from Cube. Do you know how mix that song, Get Involved, for the PJs, for um, Q-Tip and uh, Raphael. Uh, Raphael Sadiq? That's your mix. That and, makes sense. And, 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 and Q-Tip loved it. He said he wanted me to mix Vibrant Thing. Who makes that, Bob Power? I don't know. No, he masters. Bob Power's a mastering engineer, master disc. Um, I, um, I play that record, I'll Get Involved. That's a record that doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. I always love my mama. Yeah. And I mixed we real strings. He had uh, Claire Fisher do the strings. Rest in peace, Claire Fisher. Claire Fisher wrote the strings for Anniversary. Wrote all the strings for all of the, the bars records you ever heard. Mm. You know, be, Stay With Me. Yeah. All them strings. Claire Fisher did the strings That's for why that. that record stands the test of time. And he mixed it digital. We mixed it digital on a big, expensive console, which was brand new at the time. It was um, It was called the SSL 9000J. That motherfucker came in at one million dollars. Wow. wow! The tape machine was Mitsubishi Digital, forty-eight track digital. So it was that we were doing it like Steely Dan, like we wow. were mixing it digital. And those records stand the test of time. Too. God fucking damn! I went to see their <laughs> last uh, show at the Montreux Jazz Festival right before Walter Becker passed away. Wow! I saw I just, them I just, I just Google searched him. He was yeah. part of the Brecker Brothers. Yeah. Steely Dan, but they had their own albums too, the Brecker Brothers. Yeah. Fuck. You wow. know this stuff, bro? You're too young for this. Man, I, look, I'm sitting here like. You know, a older researcher. Than you, right? Yes, you're my big brother. <laughs> you're my big brother. But I, you know, I had records in the crib. My father had records in the crib. And I feel like this is why we connected because we come from different parts of the world, different styles of hip hop. We still we connected in that on that unity, music. that one unique thing that, the, that, that consolidated us. Is yeah. That's the fucking music. Yeah. And knowing, that's, that's reading world. those album credits and knowing who did what. That's why you so learned it. Yeah. That's why you're so experienced in that. 
Yes, indeed. Hey, man, am I holding you up? I feel like I'm just, I'm just no, letting man. the tequila just take over at this point. <laughs> well, I, I, I was looking at that too. I was trying to figure out which one was water, but well, you know, one of them is water, here. and one of them is water. It, <laughs> Fire water. We gonna need some BC powder after this, but uh, I hear. <laughs> I need that a straw too. <laughs> we're not snorting it. Oh, okay. Don't snort it, guys. Okay. You drink it. You throw it to the back of your throat and then drink something. See, sweet. pause. <laughs> You do what with it? We Listen, I said okay. what I said. Now I got a question for you. I hear that when you travel, you like to cook breakfast. Who for told the people you that I be cooking? Listen, don't worry about all of that. That's what I heard. We That's got what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> so can you share us like your either your favorite breakfast to make for your travel companions? I got a Kroger card. So I always go and try to buy fresh fare, eggs, you know, organic eggs, turkey bacon, you know, all these cool things. Because when I first toured, there was no food that you could eat that could sustain you through a tour. Right. So you living on like the gas road, station food? Yeah, yeah, you gotta live off of you gotta live <laughs> off of burritos and, and, yeah. and lunchables. We're dead. I love lunchables. Yeah, of you course. ain't never toured. You never toured. You go, no, touring get, is, you know, you get hungry every four hours. Touring is you gotta drive eight hours first before we stop. So we buying them little microwave lasagnas, and them shits taste like I'm uh, if, if you can imagine what a, a, a squirrel ass tastes like, it's like this is some, some bullshit. So it's I just probably started, nutty too. Every time I go on tour now, <laughs> Sorry. I'll, I'll be like, "Is there a Kroger around here?" And we go hit Kroger, and I'll spend like eighty dollars on motherfucking food, and maybe another forty on a knife and a, and a you know a big skillet. And we having like mushroom, devil eggs, or real eggs, or scrambled jack cheese, and you know what I mean? Like you know, I'm a, I my salt hand is dope. Like oh, I'm not a salty salt cooker. Bae? I'm not. A, no, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm salt Dave. The salt Dave. You know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> I don't, I don't do it down the elbow. It's like <laughs> you got to have that shit right. Like it's a thing. Like salt shouldn't be. You know, I come from salty sister cookers, right? Oh, like gosh. the bitches that have, they'll have salt with chicken. <laughs> yep. You know. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. When you bite the chicken, and your blood pressure go up, and you gotta go outside and wet it. That, <laughs> you gotta, that's you know, like the first time I made fried you chicken. You gotta drink that shit in a, a cup of water, eat the chicken. But no, I can burn. Like can that's burn. that's my whole little thing. Like you gotta eat to live. Yes, you dig. And every four hours, like I'm 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 skinny, but I got a fat man's like you know idea of food. Like I could be eating now and be thinking about what I'm gonna eat later. Yeah. <laughs> Doing that. Like, mm, that lasagna gonna be good as fuck. You know, that's me. But no, I cook for my boys. And it it, it may when people are full, they don't talk. When they eating, they don't talk. <laughs> that's Especially if it's good. I this is my my biggest flex. I went to Terrace Martin's house. And this is my guy, my, one of hey, my young understudies. We um we decided to do gumbo because you know, dog mm. pound's gonna pull up. I'm like, you know, I know these niggas. I told you. So we go get, I go get, get gumbo ingredients. Mm-hmm. And I'm over here. I'm over here making a roux. With love. I'm over here, Bell. I'm making a Trinity. You know, it's like booyah base, but it's not. It's a gravy. Wow. I'm going to treat the <laughs> shrimp. Everything's separate. Boom. So this turns into a beautiful gumbo without the sassafras, without the filet. So no, it's well, it's not, how is it's it gumbo gotta, then? Well, it's not gumbo because I didn't put the I didn't put the these are the elements I left out only because everybody don't like that. I, these are the elements I left out. I left the the filet out and I left the uh, okra uh, okra out. That's not gumbo. Yes, it is. It's a clean gumbo. It's I don't just, like gumbo. You know, I don't like okra either. The, but you gotta well, have it in the gumbo. You eat it's around African. it. You know, that's an African plant, right? The whole thing is this. They call it gumbo. It's for my gumbo. It's for you know. It's for this shit. Whatever. Yeah, it's slimy. You know? I, you, you need know. that slime. Well, kind of. When you fry it, my mom, she's Creole. She taught me how to fry it. When you fry it, it freezes all of that gluten until you put it back in water, and then it turns back into slime. But when I made the thing, I made it, and I steamed rice, and it's about how it all comes together. You mm-hmm. know, it's all about taste. Man, your girl over here with her pasta blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody sounds like the name of it. Isaac Hayes. Song. Everybody lined up <laughs> because they've been smelling our food the whole time. Everybody lined up and they just took that gumbo pot down to here, and we all sitting that around corrupt as we had a round table like this, and nobody's talking. It's just a change, and that's the biggest compliment you can oh, give for a sure. cook. 
And it's like, hey, can I get some more? It's cool. Man. It's three cups of rice, bro. That shit is, man, knock yourself out. Shit. No, I burned. I burn. I, I, I'm fucking Creole. Look at my skin. I'm yellow. Okay, because you're Creole, I, could, I ain't going to try to, we could, to challenge with the gumbo, you, but ask Steve about some my Arcadian gumbo. Food. You know, Cajun is really Arcadian, right? It's the Arcadian people, the Geechees, mm-hmm. and you know. Ar- and you worked you with um, Problem. I think his people from there, too. Problem is just, that's my little nephew, His people bro. from Louisiana. That's, that's why he did that, like, what? Over. Because yeah. he understood. Give a fuck. Like, yeah. yeah. Problem's a genius. Yeah, He's the a first- smart dude. The first yeah. restaurant I cooked in was a New Orleans style restaurant, you and cooked? I was—I'm a chef, and I had to make the gumbos. So Why I like let me go through all that thing. <laughs> I, I was with you. I was with you. I was enjoying it. I just, went down the road. I was—I was there. Get I was me off at the pass and be like, nah, I'm you, chef, was, I get you it. killed it. But <laughs> so you understand? Yeah, what I, what I, I cook yes, breakfast. I understand. Yes. Yes. Because guess what? That's why she has that question's not on here. That was well, a actually, chef question. Well, actually, the question Ask was- Ask Rodney O about my food. People, my, my grandson tells me I need to open a restaurant. Do it. Because I know how to cook for him. When you cook for them little finicky ass little motherfucking eight year, seven year oh, olds. Oh, yeah. That's when you know And them motherfuckers be like, it's the best pastrami I've ever had in my life. <laughs> <laughs> not pastrami. You've been on this earth no, for I, seven I, years, bro. What do you exactly, know? Exactly. What do you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, no. I would like to say it is our honor and our pleasure to have you. As a guest, can I come back? You can. You have an open invitation. You can come and hang out. Um, what's next for DJ Quick? What's next for DJ Quick is um, honestly making sure that I don't Groundhog Day 2020. Wow, I'm sick of all the bad luck. Mm. I don't want to keep living 2020. Or every time it's like 2021 is gonna be better. No, it wasn't. 2022, we're gonna be living. We got. Nigga, I'm paying $8 a gallon for gas. <laughs> like, come on. And I got all big cars. <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> I just don't want to keep repeating 2020. Right. No um, I'm discovering really awesome new young artists who aren't really affected by, you know, the things that we're affected by because we're so connected to growth of black people and, mm-hmm. you know, the economy and, you know, the news and we're current. And this is one of the best podcasts ever. You know oh, that, right? I appreciate it. But you know that. I oh, man. I, this is not missed on you. Yeah, bro. We work we, hard on we it. We fucking love you, bro. If you need anything from me and anybody else, we're here. But I just, this is my thing. I want to blow up these cool new artists and I'm just finding new portals to put them through. Not mm-hmm. just the whole system where you got to do this. It's got to be Spotify. It's got to be this. It's, there's still ways that the, how you got my red tape. How yeah. the fuck did you get my red tape when it was, I only made a thousand of them and sold right. them by hand. I signed them the red tape and put my signature on them. And it was mm-hmm. only a thousand made and sold all of them. People used to try to see that. You know, I would go be like, Hey, I got, got these cassettes. Niggas was rich. They'd be like, Give me all of them. No, man, no. I got to drive to Compton. I got to go to Carson. I got 10 for this right. guy, five for this guy, two for this guy. They want to just buy them all and be this. They was trying to buy me out. I was a, my own distributor of my own music. Wow. I want to go back to that where you make these really dope pieces of tangible art that people, not an NFT, but that people can feel that they're a part of, that they can hold on to. And it came from you, the person. Because once you're gone, mm-hmm. whew, you're gone. And the value of that becomes valueless or valuable to where it's priceless. I just want to be, I just want to be, I want to turn into a block of gold at the end of this shit. Yes, indeed. I don't want to go to a crematorium or more. I want to turn into a fucking block of gold. Well, stay golden. Pony boy. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, man. Love you're, you're the fucking Thank you for doing this show with us. <laughs>